Good morning. In case you haven't already figured it out, this series of messages that I've been giving uh, over the last several weeks is my way of uh, working through uh, what's going on in our world and in America. I didn't intend to be preaching from uh, the Old Testament after we finished our series in Romans, the Gospel of God, as we look forward to uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday. But as I shared in a couple of messages earlier, um, when I realized that 2 plus 2 wasn't equal, equaling 4 after our recent presidential election and all the aftermath of that, I began to pay a closer attention to uh, the political scene. And I turned to scripture in order to make sense of uh, what I was uh, noticing. Uh, because I wanted to respond uh, prudently, wisely, and biblically. Uh, because I believe that uh, there's nothing in life that we uh, encounter that the Bible doesn't speak to. And the first thing that God woke me up to was the fact that the issues that I saw as disastrous in the United States were actually worldwide. They weren't just in the United States. And I wondered if um, I was not awake, that maybe perhaps my uh, congregation and you folks weren't wide awake. So I wanted to open your eyes to several things and just have you think about them. For first, uh, have you noticed how many heads of state and governmental ministers at the highest levels have resigned in the last few weeks. This is true in uh, uh, the UK, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Italy, and in Asia. Military intervention uh, has been uh, seen in the Asian country of Myanmar. Or Myanmar. They had a recent uh, presidential election where there were accusations of fraud where uh, it was asserted that uh, major blocks of votes uh, were switched from one candidate to another by the use of uh, the internet. And I found that very curious. And so I started to look into it and I found that the same voting machines that we used in our presidential election was used in Myanmar. And uh, these machines allow large blocks of votes to be moved by uh, internet from people sitting uh, at computers halfway around the world. And um, I found that to be very curious. At home, the uh, issue of voter fraud uh, or the evidence uh, is in my mind overwhelming. Multiple counties have had votes cast far greater by the thousands than people who were registered to vote. In some counties, <laughs> there were more votes than people that even lived there. Uh, a forensic analysis of some of the same voting machines that, was that were used in uh, Asia, that were used here in the United States, showed absolute hacking. They leave an, uh, an identity, an IP address it's called, where you can trace a computer that has signed on to that machine that was located in China and in Italy of all places. If you just stop and look at the statistics, the mathematics, it should tell anyone with any common sense that something is wrong. First, Trump received more votes than any other sitting president who was seeking a second term, ever. And yet he lost to his opponent, this guy Biden, not by a few votes, but by millions of votes. That seems to be a little curious. 
What's worse is that the people who should be protecting uh, the sanctity, the watchdogs, if you will, of our voting process were terribly silent. The press, the Justice Department, the court system, certainly the Supreme Court, they were all uh, silent unless you raised questions and challenged uh, the results. Then you were uh, shamed and uh, ridiculed and uh, forcibly silenced. And this was by those people who are charged uh, to defend the integrity of our voting. Christianity, the faith uh, system upon which our founding fathers created this nation, the Christian values upon which they wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, it's now being called hate speech. Isn't that curious? Well, enough. I didn't intend and I don't intend to speak totally about politics per se this morning. I just wasn't sure that uh, Y'all uh, were aware of the magnitude and the scope of the problem. This is not politics as usual. What's going on here is war. It's not between Republicans and Democrats. I've said that before. I've known all along this was not, uh, and I've said this to you before, this is a, a spiritual war between God and Satan, between good and evil. Now, I hope that you are aware that the Bible teaches us very clearly that there will be, in end times, a one-world government. That's where the Antichrist and the false prophet that we find in Revelation come into being part of that government, and they have their final battle with God before time ends and eternity begins. So quite frankly, everything we see happening in the world and in the United States is uh, totally biblically accurate. It's setting the stage for the return of Jesus Christ. But the question is, how should we who are followers of Jesus respond uh, to, in the face of this evil that we see in our country today? Are we just fight back? against unconstitutional and oppressive government mandates? Or are we to sit back and um, just let them take our freedoms one at a time? Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, our constitutional rights? Are we to just let a small number, and I mean a small number, of phenomenally wealthy people with great power dominate us and the world for their personal gain and our loss? Well, as I pondered that, I realized the answer to that question is actually quite simple. If these people are to succeed and to form a, a one world government in which they dominate and we have no rights at all unless they're given to us by them, and that God is active in this process, I'm not saying uh, that he would approve. I'm just saying that he possibly would use these folks to bring about his will uh, and prepare the world for the end of time. If that is true, then all the resistance that we may muster will come to nothing because um, even God's children cannot thwart the will of God. But just the fact that... Uh, I and uh, I'm, I'm sure millions of others have this gut response to fight back, to resist, demonstrates to me uh, that this one world government will come into being, because the Bible says it will, but perhaps not right now. At least I pray not right now. I believe that God can do something very remarkable supernatural, through his children. Well, 
why do I believe that? <laughs> we'll get to that, but I've got to get through my message first. All right. The title of my message this morning is God's Way Back, just like last Sunday, but with an added word, the word rejected. I want to share with you some truths uh, before we get to uh, what I hope to be good news. And I want to give a disclaimer. I could be totally wrong about the good news. I pray that I'm not wrong, but I could be. I don't presume to know the mind of God. Jesus taught us when he was here on earth that he would come back when we least expect it. And like a thief in the night that comes to break into your home, you're not even going to see him coming. Actually, that reminds me of what Barack Obama said recently. You're not even going to see it coming. I don't think he meant the coming of Jesus. He meant something evil. So, Let's go back to our text last week in Jeremiah chapter 6. And I'd invite you to put me on pause and get your Bibles and open to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah and turn to chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 16. And while you're doing that, may I make the suggestion that you always have your Bible with you uh, when you come to watch uh, one of my messages or my videos. Um, I want you to see, uh, by reading along with me, that I am not uh, giving you my opinion, that I am teaching and speaking uh, God's Word. So uh, bring your Bibles. Be ready to read along. So let's read verse 16, chapter 6 of Jeremiah. Listen to what God says to the people of Judah. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. And then walk in it. And you will find rest for your soul. Now we read that last week. But the last phrase of that verse 16 is very telling. God says, but you said, no, we will not walk in it. Now you may remember how many times I have said to you the word but uh, is very significant in uh, the, the scriptures. How marvelous it is when it refers to the actions of God. But here in this instance, it's referring to the actions of human beings. And now it isn't so marvelous. It's a disaster. I want you to think about this. God tells his people, his chosen people, how to be rescued from godless leaders that were abusing them, exploiting them, leading them to destruction, to imminent captivity and loss of freedom. God tells them what to do. And they say, no, nope, we're not going to do that. Can you imagine the created being telling his or her creator who loves them, no, we're not going to do what you told us to do. Even in the face of disaster, their sister country, this is the southern kingdom of Israel, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The northern tribes, Israel proper, had already been taken into captivity by the Assyrians a little bit more than 100 years prior. So they know God is capable to do this. Look at verse 17. God continues. He says, I have appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, no. We will not listen. God says he's appointed watchmen. Listen for the sound of the trumpet. The watchmen were prophets like Jeremiah. Good prophets who were speaking God's word to the people. In the ancient world, even like in the Middle Ages, 
When something important was going to be proclaimed to the people, the trumpeters would blare the trumpets, and then the uh, apostle or the uh, herald for the uh, important person, the king perhaps, that was giving the message would speak. And so God is drawing on that metaphor. The people said, no, we're not going to listen. You may say, I said initially when I read this, what idiots. But then I say, wait a minute, maybe we ought not judge these folks too quickly. Are we not guilty of the same thing? I'm just asking the question. You know, about three weeks ago, we looked at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, where God told us that if we want him to heal our nation, to rescue us, that we were to humble ourselves and acknowledge our dependency on him, that he is sovereign, that he rules because this is his creation, that we were to pray earnestly to seek counsel from him. Don't trust in Trump. Don't trust in the military. Don't trust in anyone. Trust in God. Pray and seek him. To know him. To be able to understand or hear his voice. And then turn from our wicked ways. To change our behavior. Well, let me ask you a question. After that message, after reading that from the word of God, how many of you have changed anything in any way? I'm just asking the question. Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you spending time, quiet time, listening to God speak to you from whatever you read? Because that's one of the primary ways God speaks to us is through his word. Do you, pray? Do you seek his counsel? Do you ask him what he wants you to do? How you can uh, live more uh, obediently before him? Have you changed any behavior that God has asked you to change? Well, you know, it's not that we have said, no, I'm not going to do that, or no, I'm not going to listen to you. But maybe we have done that passively by not doing something He's told us to do, to spend time with him, quietly reading, listening, talking to him. You know, it's like our youngest boy, who's almost 40. Gosh, one has gotten old. It's a shame. <laughs> it's going to be cold around the ranch. When he was a teenager, he was the sweetest, most compliant, obedient, gentle, teenage boy you could have ever met. And he's pretty much the same way as a grown man. And when his mom would say to him, hey, go clean your room. He was a teenager, right? <laughs> Take those clothes that I've washed and dried and folded and I put them on your chair, I put them on your dresser, put them in your drawers, straighten your room. He would always come and hug his mom and kiss her, say, yes, ma'am. He would never ever say no. And those clothes that mama had just washed and dried and folded found their way immediately back into the dirty clothes hamper. They didn't get put away. And when mom learned that trick, of course, that's when she said, you're going to learn to do your own laundry or you can go to school smelling uh, dirty. <laughs> but my point is this. We can say no with our behavior without being openly defiant. So when God tells us to do something, to humble ourselves, to pray earnestly, to seek him, to change how we live, he means for us to do it and do it now. Don't wait till next week, till tomorrow, till, till New Year's so you can have a New Year's resolution. Huh? Now. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we're no different than this ancient people of Judah that was God's chosen people, the Jews. And you know what happened to them. Listen as God speaks in verse 19 of chapter 6. Hear, O earth, 
I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my word, and they have rejected my law. Do you understand what he's doing here? He's using godless pagans to come in and punish his chosen people, the people that he loves, the people that he created from just one couple, Abraham and Sarah, the people that he led out of captivity in Egypt generations earlier, led them through the desert, led them into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and now he says he's bringing disaster on them as punishment for their sin. Do you not think that God could do that to America too? The folks in Judah didn't think it would happen. God would never allow Jerusalem and the walls around the gates to be torn down, the temple to be uh, raised, but he did. The walls were torn down, the gates were burned, the temple was ransacked. Did not God give us this country as a gift? We are unique in all of human history, and or were in terms of our government, our freedoms, for the people, by the people, because our forefathers wanted to worship the one true God. Have we not allowed godless pagans to tell us that we cannot teach our children in school that they were uniquely made or made uniquely as an individual by God? That they're special because they reflect his image. We let these same people tell us in effect, you cannot speak about God publicly. We don't believe in God. And now we are letting the gift of our freedoms be taken away from us by our elected leaders right now. And we've allowed it. Look at what God says in verse 20. He says, what do I care about incense from Sheba or sweet calamus from distant lands? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable and your sacrifices do not please me. Wow, those are some scary words because God is saying he doesn't want empty religious ceremony. He doesn't want sacrifices, which was the Old Testament motif for repentance and saying, I'm sorry for my sin. He says, I want obedience. He wants changed hearts and changed behavior. He told us what to do. He wants us, he expects us to do it. You know, God told King Saul the same message through the prophet priest Samuel. God had given a specific instruction to King Saul and Saul didn't follow it. And then he lied to cover up his disobedience. And God sent Samuel the priest to confront Saul and Saul lied to him. And of course, Saul, uh, excuse me, uh, Samuel caught him and, and, and he was outed. And then he turned and said, well, okay, now uh, I want to offer some sacrifices. I want to say sorry to God. And Samuel said, you're on your own sucker. I'm done with you. God says your kingdom, your rule over as king over Israel is over. And I'm not going to offer that. God doesn't want your sacrifice. He wanted your obedience in the first place. Now, my whole point this morning is this. Our world and our country is in serious trouble. We are about, and I'm not being dramatic, as I said last week, we are about to be taken over by godless pagans who want to dominate the world and dominate us. The rights that we would have will come only from them at their behest. And they're doing it right now in front of us. They're going to do it in our lifetime. God has told us that he will forgive our sin and he will heal our nation if 
we do what he told us to do. We better take him seriously. We better get it done. Our country, our world, but certainly America, who was founded on the Christian faith, needs a spiritual renewal. We need to turn to God and obey him. Well, I mentioned that I have hope. Let me give you three significant reasons for my hope. First is that Jesus changed the world with 12 men who were willing to obey him and serve him. Actually 13 when you include the Apostle Paul and you got to include him because he was stellar. All right. Think what he, Jesus, can do if his people will to pray to where to turn to him and be obedient. Secondly, well, my point there is to have trust in God, in Jesus, not any human being. Trust him, but that means you have to obey him. Secondly, the Apostle Paul says in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians, that at the end of time, God is going to remove his Holy Spirit from the world. He's going to wash his hands of the evilness of humanity. Well, the Holy Spirit is still here and working because people are still coming out of Satan's lies and deceptions and the world and coming into the family of God. Peter, Paul, all the New Testament writers somewhere at some time in their writing tell us that God doesn't want one soul to perish, one person who is willing to turn away from their sin and turn to him and ask for forgiveness and live righteously before him. He wants that one soul to be saved. So if God is still working, People are still being rescued from Satan's lies. There's hope. The third thing is that Paul told us as we studied Romans 9, 10, and 11 about the fact that God put a veil over the eyes of the Jewish people when they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, which allowed the Gentiles to come into the family of God. But in end time, as time comes to an end, God's going to remove that veil from their eyes and the Jewish people, not every Jew, but a large majority of the Jewish people are going to re, uh, recant their rejection of Jesus. They're going to recognize Jesus as their Messiah, acknowledge him as their Messiah and God's Savior, and they're going to become witnesses uh, for the gospel of God. They're going to become evangelists for Christianity. That hasn't happened either. That will happen. So at this point, it is up to us, the followers of Jesus Christ, the church. We are responsible for sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is forgiveness in faith in Jesus, that we can come out of the world and into God's family. But we must be obedient. We must be passionately obedient. And God can save our nation. And he can demonstrate through his people, as he says in 2 Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will do these four things, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their nation. God will demonstrate his sovereignty and his love for all people if we are obedient. Now, I know that he can. The issue is, will he? He told us to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek him, to be obedient, to change our behavior. Because his will will be done. Nothing can stand in opposition to God's will. So my admonition to us in these very turbulent, dangerous times is to pray, to pray consistently, to pray that we as his children will be obedient, 
pray hard because time is short. The enemy is absolutely already inside the gates. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that whatever we see or face in life, your word gives us clarity and a way back that you are indeed sovereign and in control and that we can uh, prosper, uh, uh, heal if we are obedient and follow your word. So I pray, Father, that we would do that and that you would heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.